Jason got to tell a, uh, hey Ben, Ben, you don't, you're too old for that. Uh, um, Jason got to tell a story from, when he, from his hometown, so I'm going to tell one too. Uh, I grew up in Michigan, um, the great big mitten looking state up in the north. Everyone in Texas thinks it's, you know, Minnesota, Michigan, they're all the same. They're not. It literally sticks out like a sore thumb. It's a big mitten. It's America's high five. So anyway, before I moved to Texas, um, in high school, I worked at a garden center for like six years. So I did a lot of, you may not know this about me, but I know a lot about begonias and petunias and, and all that stuff. I, really what I did was I helped uh, people load their, uh, their, their mulch and their lava rocks and everything into their cars and stuff. And so I was working there, and uh, it was a uh, hot summer's day, and there was this woman who needed help loading her, her, her mulch, and so loaded it all up for her, and she said, you know what, uh, do you do side work? Could you come to my house and help me with, you know, put this in? And I said, yeah, sure. I actually needed National Honor Society hours, so I'll come and do some community service. It ended up that, that she really wrote me into this huge yard project, and she wasn't paying me because it was all service hours. And she, I mean, the stories she told, I mean, she was a, a, kind of a racist. I'll just say, <laughs> I mean, she was just saying some things that I was like, I don't really enjoy this, you know, situation. I need to get out of it. I don't know how to get out of it. And so finally, after about... 20 hours of working for her, I said, uh, I can't work for you anymore because uh, my, my grandma is taking me to France. <laughs> and she was like, really? You're going to France? I was like, yeah. Uh, uh, I totally made up story. I, you know, I, I, I was not going to France, but it was the story that I told her. And she said, you're going to France? That's exciting. And so anyway, it, it kind of cut that off. I, I wasn't able to help her anymore with her lawn project. I'm not saying to lie, don't ever lie, but in high school, I, I didn't know any other way out, and so from then on, every, so anyway, I, once I was done with that, the last time I worked for her, she gave me this $75 Kohl's gift card for, her, for my work, and I was like, oh gosh, like now I feel really guilty that I lied to her, and so I went to, you know, the garden center and bought her some flowers, anyways, all that to say, every single time I worked at that garden center, I was hiding. Like, every time I saw, like, anything that might look like her, I'd run to the back, or just the rest of my time there was spent hiding and, and just hoping I didn't see her or she didn't see me. And actually, kind of another side story is that my dad, he's a mason, and he was doing a job for somebody, and he heard the story that I told her I was moving to France. And so to get out of a job he was doing, he told that lady that he was moving to France, I don't know, it's kind of become a joke in our family, but the point is, <laughs> when you work for, you know, in a small town, you get to know people, right? You get to see the same faces, and you get, you know, real comfortable in that. Um, that can be a good thing and a bad thing, right? I mean, it's nice to go to the, the HEB and see people you know, um, or people that you want trying to avoid and hop an aisle away, but, you know, it's living in a, in a small, anybody grew up in a small town? Yeah, a lot of us, okay? So you know what it's like. Um, but there's something about hometowns. When you go back to that hometown, I'm still kind of looking for her every time I go to, that, to my hometown in, in Michigan. And, you know, they're comfortable places, our hometowns. Uh, I want you guys to open up today to Luke 4, where Jesus talks about hometowns, okay? Where he talks about what it's like to live in, in, in a hometown. You're there, Doug? Okay, good. Luke 4, this is Jesus talking about, uh, basically he's starting his ministry. He's starting his public ministry and he's announcing that he is the Messiah and he's doing it right in his hometown, right amongst the people that he grew up with, amongst the, the church that he grew up with, in uh, the people that have known him since he was a boy. He's announcing his public ministry in, he goes back to his hometown to do it, okay? So let's read in uh, Luke 4, verses 14 through 30. It says, And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the all surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. 
And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendants and sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him, and wondering at, at the gracious works which were f uh, falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city has been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So here's Jesus in his hometown announcing the beginning of his ministry. And at first, these people are pretty receptive because he becomes kind of a hometown hero. I mean, they saw Jesus grow up, right? He, he knew the Bible very well. He uh, was a Bible scholar and learned it inside and out. And, and people that knew him, they saw his life and they saw what a pure life he lived. I'm sure at the point where he's saying, you know what, the Messiah is coming and it's me, a lot of these people in the hometown were like, yeah, that's great, actually. This is pretty cool. You know, the, the, the guy that I grew up with is, you know could actually be the king, the Messiah, you know, and their idea was that he was going to be a physical king that would rise up and have power and give the Israelites their power back um, and, and save them. And so that was actually, you can see that they're very receptive. It says um, they were speaking well of him and that his, they said that Jesus' words were gracious. And it's kind of like one of their own is becoming the king, the savior, the Messiah. This is a good thing. And then something suddenly shifted from us glorifying and praising Jesus and what he was saying to getting ready to kill him and throw him off a cliff, kill him. That is a big shift. And what shifted was that he told two stories. He said, actually, what's going to happen is um, here I am trying to proclaim the gospel. And he's basically saying, but you guys won't receive it because you're from my hometown. And he gives two examples of the Old Testament. And Jesus didn't uh, quote too many people from the Old Testament, really. There's only a handful that he did. He didn't talk about Samson. You know, he didn't talk about a lot of the, the big Bible people that we talk about in the Old Testament, but he did mention Elisha and Elijah. And we studied in Elijah, the story of Elijah in our life groups, about how, um, you know, uh, there was a famine in the land, and Elijah needed um, some water. He needed uh, shelter. He needed food. And of all the different widows, of the Jewish widows that God could have sent him to, instead God chose to send him to someone who is not Jewish, and she's the one that took care of him. And she's the one that had faith to give, her, give Elijah, Elijah his, her last ounce of flour and saw a miracle happen. So he's basically saying God could have sent him to any Jew, but he didn't. And the second story was, same with Naaman, the great commander, of this army. He said, God could have healed, there were many lepers in that day, this great warrior, many Jewish lepers, people in the Jewish society and the family that could, God could have healed, but none of them had, uh, were able to be healed, but Naaman was. So basically what Jesus is saying, the message that I'm, that I'm bringing to you, that, that, that there will be a release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed, will not be them. <laughs> yeah, this is great news for the world, but he's basically saying, but not for you because you won't receive it. You won't accept it because, of, because y your faith is not there. And that is where it became from hail the hometown hero to kill him. 
Because here we are Pharisees, here we are Jewish people trying to do everything right, and now he's a heretic. He's saying things that are not right, and we need to kill him. And basically he's saying the reason that they would not accept him, the reason that they wouldn't have the faith to really see him for, for who he was, was because he was common to them. He had grown up with them. Be the very reason that, that they're excited that it's a hometown hero, that, that this guy that we grew up with, became their own fault. The fact that they knew him so well and they became so familiar with him, they didn't have the faith to see him for who he really was. They only saw him through the lens of, you're one of us, you're going to do what we think, you're going to, you know, you, you've been trained the way we are, and, and they expected that king to come in, in a very specific way. And Jesus is saying, no, the gospel is open to those who think outside the box, the people who are not comfortable with me, <laughs> you know. And it's kind of like I, the best thing I can describe it as is there's uh, one of my favorite shows is The Office. And uh, Michael Scott is the, the, uh, the boss of The Office, and he's so funny in that show. And every time I see Steve Carell in other things, I, I just have the smirk on my face because I'm waiting for a punchline because he's funny to me. And he can never be serious. In my mind, he can never be taken seriously. It's kind of like that actor that you see over and over again, you know, one of your favorite actors, and you can never unsee them in that same character, right? And that's kind of how they saw Jesus. They were already seeing him with all these filters on. And he said, no, I need people who will see me for who I really am. And that's why um, they, they were not actually going to be able to receive what he had to offer because they wouldn't take their blinders off. And so this is somewhat of a warning to me. Um, as a Christian, it can be easy to get comfortable with Christianity. It can be easy to get comfortable with, with the name of Jesus even, or the Word of God to read it and say, I've read that before and just keep moving on. It can be really um, dangerous to live that way. God wants us to live in a way that makes us a little bit uncomfortable. And that's why the title of my sermon today is Don't Get Too Comfortable. <laughs> So I see some of you wiggling in your seats. It might get a little uncomfortable. It got a little bit uncomfortable at camp when we said, uh, a quiet church is a? Church. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. At camp, we were just at camp, at youth camp, and uh, they kept yelling that. A quiet church is a? Church. So we need to be a little bit loud in church. That's okay, right? It's okay to get a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so let's get a little bit uncomfortable. So um, I want to live in a place in my life, in my Christian walk, where I'm not really too comfortable like these Pharisees were. They already predicted what Jesus would be like. They already kind of had him figured out. That's a very dangerous place to live. I want to live in a place where my heart is always ready for God to use me and stretch me and be uncomfortable and make me do hard things. And, and you know, he said the, the, the road is wide, you know, that leads to destruction, but the road is narrow that leads to heaven. The, and he says it's hard, too. It's not easy. It's hard. God's going to call us to do hard things and to get a little bit uncomfortable. And if you're not doing that, that's like I'm saying, it's a little bit of a dangerous place to be. We want to stay where the word is always fresh to us. And God's always asking new things of us because that's where we need to live. Um, and so I want to take a look at one of these stories that Jesus mentions here. And he's saying the very reason that you won't accept me is look at these two stories. He said, first, the story of Elijah, which we studied in our life group. So I thought I'd look at the other story of Elisha and uh, the story of Naaman. So if you'll open up to 2 Kings 5, 1 through 8, actually 5, 1 through 9, make you open your Bibles again to 2 Kings. We're going to look at the story of Naaman. And we're going to try to see what Jesus saw in him and, and why Naaman got this healing, whereas all the other lepers in the land would not get a healing, but, but Naaman did. What is it about him? And what is it about his character? How did he live his life so that he was ready and willing to hear and get healed? Um, so Naaman was a captain of the king of, the Aram, uh, king of Aram. So I'm going to start reading uh, just verses 1 through, one through 8. And we're going to kind of go through this little by little. Uh, Naaman, captain of the army of the king Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram, or Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master... 
uh, were with the prophet who is in Samaria, who is Elisha. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and ten thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Okay, so this is the first part of the story. It's the setup. It's that here's this great commander who, from the slave girl who, who, who they conquered, uh, you know, one of the wars in, in Israel, they, they got a slave girl from Israel, and, and she saw that, that this commander had leprosy, and she spoke out, she probably got a little bit uncomfortable, stepped out, and, and told him, hey, there's a man that's a prophet of the Lord that can heal you. And the first thing that we see in this kind of a theme within these first few verses is humility. And though Naaman was a mighty warrior, though he had many accolades, he also had a drop of humility, enough humility that God could work with it so that God could actually heal him. And so even though it's not not a lot of humility, I think we see some in him. God had given him victories. God had given this man great pride, actually. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have pride in your work, but he had a great flaw as well. He had leprosy. And I believe that flaw really kind of kept him grounded. And a lot of times we say, Lord, take this thing from me. Take this, you know, this battle that I have from me. But really, that's one thing that keeps you close to God. You ever notice that? God may use your weaknesses to keep him close to you. And that, I think, is part of what was happening here, was that he had this great flaw. And there was some confusion in the word leprosy back in the day. Um, leprosy doesn't always exactly mean the way that we think of it today, as this, uh, it's called Hansen's disease. But uh, it could mean boils, it could mean um, eczema, um, uh, uh, fungal infections. There's a lot of different, different re- ways that you could to look at this word of leprosy. But the fact is, it was a great source of shame for the guy. And you can imagine, as a great commander, you look great with your armor on, but as soon as you take it off, you see the the darkness inside. And I think that's what we do a lot of times, right? We prostrate ourselves to be kind of big and and, and conquering, and, and, you know, we, we do what we can to make ourselves look great. But on the inside, you might have a lot of darkness in you, right? That can happen. And so... Like Paul said, too, he had a thorn in his side. A lot of times in his writing, he said the same thing. Like, there, there are sometimes sins that can, that maybe things that you didn't, you know, make happen yourself, but things that, you know, like leprosy, that, you know, he didn't, he didn't do anything to get it necessarily, but now he, bas- he has it, and that kind of keeps him humble in a lot of ways. So what Jesus was saying in this story, the reason he brought this up was because there were many lepers, many people who had leprosy, but he was the only one at least who was willing to, to hear what other people had to say. And, and he picked him out because the gospel was for the marginalized. It was for the lepers. It was for the people who were hurt, the people who had the brokenness in them, not the Pharisees who had their whole lives perfectly together. The gospel is for the hurting and the lost and the broken and not the people of the hometown necessarily. And that's why he chose Naaman, to mention specifically. And that was totally the opposite of, of what the Pharisees were expecting. Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous. And so the Pharisees didn't have humility at all in them. They knew Jesus inside and out. They knew what they were looking for, and they already had their goggles on. And at least Naaman was, was broken to the point where he knew that he had a flaw, in touch with the flawed person that he is. I was reading N.T. Wright, 
a great theologian, and he said this. He said, the people who will benefit from the gospel are the outsiders, the wrong people, the foreigners. Even perhaps the commander of the enemy army, Naaman the Syrian, to whom Jesus refers as the one man who was healed by the prophet Elisha, the commander of the army that in the Old Testament had been attacking the Israelites. Startling though this is, it fits with everything else we know about Jesus' public teaching. Love your enemies, he told his followers, and he elaborated on the point from a dozen different angles. Forgiveness was at the heart of the message. Not perfection, not trying to get everything right like the Pharisees were. It's all about forgiveness and mercy and humility. It says in Matthew 5, 3, the kingdom of God, the exact kingdom of God that Jesus was bringing to people belongs to the poor in spirit. And the word poor in spirit means those who are not spiritually arrogant. The kingdom of God belongs to the people who are not arrogant, (laughs) but are humble enough to receive what God wants to give them. Pride has no place in the kingdom. And um, I easily fall into this. I mean, we all do, right, in our daily walk. Um, We can predict our own lives. We can control things that are happening in our lives. Um, Just a couple weeks ago, I was in Japan on a study abroad trip with Texas State. I teach at Texas State as well. And we were with 13 students, and um, part of my job up there was to lead the students but also um, work on our website. We had a website that we were updating. Well, come to like day two of the trip in Japan, and um, I had got a little bit wet in my backpack, and <laughs> I opened it up that night, and I saw the power go from It was plugged in, and it said from 36% to 35% to 34%. By the morning, it was cold, dead, totally gone. And I was like, what? It's a brand new laptop, too, and I needed it for this trip. And so the first thing I did was freak out, right? It's like, okay, well, this something has to be wrong. I got like five different power converters and trying to get it powered, and nothing is working. So I take it to an Apple store, well, not an Apple store, like an Apple dealer in Japan, and the language barrier is real, real rough. And so I, he's not understanding what I'm saying. He's not, I'm not understanding what he's saying. And I was like, just, I was like, broken. It's broken. And I like knocked on it and I was like, it's dead, like dead. And so whatever I could do. And he's like, okay. Uh, so he looked at it and we had to talk through a translator on the phone. And anyway, what he told me through the translator on the phone was, it's dead, beyond dead. I already knew that. But I heard it from a professional. Uh, he said, if uh, the logic board, so, so what makes the computer even work is, is the motherboard, and for Macs, it's a logic board. Now, this version of the laptop, the hard drive was connected to the logic board. So if the logic board goes bad, all of your data is gone. That was hard to hear. And he's like, do you want us to fix it? There's a chance you'll lose everything. And I was like... No, I'll take it back to America (laughs) and get it figured out there. I don't know. I just wanted a second opinion. So I considered it a loss. I was so upset. I was already planning what, you know, all the data that was on this thing. Uh, What am I going to do? I had work on there that I needed. Um, I was able to borrow laptops until I got back to the States. And then just uh, last week when I, uh, you know, was about to make my appointment here in the States, I just plugged it in. And I prayed over it, and I put my hand on it, and I just said, Lord, I just prayed. I just prayed to God. And what he revealed to me was that I went everywhere else to get this thing fixed, but I did not go to him. And I was like, Lord, I'm sorry. And I repented of that right then and there. And not just in this situation, but in all my life, God, I want to go to you for first for everything. And then I felt okay, and I was like, all right, Lord, if you want me to go to the Genius Bar appointment, I will do that, but I'm just asking, would you please fix it? And I opened it up, and the little Apple logo was on, and it works to this day. <laughs> and God, you know, if, if, he would, if it wouldn't have worked, praise God anyway. But he did, because I asked. But I caught myself being a Pharisee here in that, well, God won't fix technology, you know, he built the people that made the technology, but, you know, it's just like you can justify anything and just be like, well, God wouldn't fix a computer. Yes, he would. He would easily fix a computer. Um, and, and, but in my mind, I already had God figured out. I, I had the control of the situation. But what God wanted was the humility to say, listen, you made this thing. You know how to fix it. And that's what God desires from us. A perfect example of humility in the kingdom is the slave girl. 
The slave girl who was abducted from her family in the story, she had to serve these people that abducted her, and yet she still chose to bring the word of the God to, to Naaman and says, you know what, I know someone who can, who can fix you. Really, the story should be about the slave girl, to be honest. And she, that scripture that says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, that's what she was doing. This is not prideful of, I, I can fix your problem, Naaman. No, this was a humble pride of boasting in the Lord, saying, no, there's someone else who can fix this. And if Naaman could have healed himself, he would have. If you could fix your own problems, you probably would have by now, right? We can't fix all our problems. The fact is we all, in a way, have leprosy. We need Jesus to fix them. And he needs people that will say, I'm desperate, Lord. I'll do anything. And to be in a position where we don't have it figured out, but, but opening that door for him to do something. And I think of it not just in healings or fixing laptops, but things like when we read the Word, when we open it and we really sit and say, God, show, pretend like I've never seen this before. Show me exactly what you want to say. Even if I'm reading, you know, a line per minute. <laughs> Meditate slowly and reread it because God wants to show you new things and he doesn't want you to skim over it, you know, or just like putting your life on the line every, every morning and saying, God, this day is yours. What do you want to do with it? You know, he wants that. That's where the kingdom lives, and that's what the Pharisees got wrong, and not what I, I don't want to get that wrong. So that's one thing Naaman had. He was not, I wouldn't say a humble man, but I would say that he had a, a drip of humility that God could use. Even if it's a seed of humility, God will use it. So let's keep reading in 2 Kings uh, verses 9 through 14. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophets told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. This we see reluctantly obedience. We saw Naaman immediately first, because of pride, say, no, I'm not going to do all that stuff that you said, but eventually he obeyed. We see a, a reluctant obedience, but obedience nonetheless. He humbled himself enough to go to Elisha, but then when he got to Elisha and got his answer, he didn't like the answer. And there's two reasons that he didn't like the answer. One is because he thought he, he kind of had it figured out, right? He already had it played out exactly how he thought it should be. He thought this, this you know, prophet will come and wave his hand over and there'll be this big, big, huge thing and, and, and I'll be cleaned. And, and he just had this preconceived notion. It didn't turn out that way. So his, his pride got in the way again, but also his mind, he overthought it too. He was thinking, well, Surely I don't need to go into the Jordan River and get clean. It's not that clean. There are plenty of other ways that I can go about this, right? So it was both his pride and his brain that got in the way. And oftentimes when God tells us to do something, we overthink it. We think, well, that couldn't be, right? Um, you know, that's absurd, God. Why would you ask me to do that? That doesn't make sense. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is, obey God. If God said it, do it. He didn't realize that the Jordan River was the same river that years later Jesus Christ would be baptized in. He didn't realize that, that the Jordan River was the river that God used to water his holy land. Though it may have looked a little bit dirtier than the clean rivers of Damascus, there's a reason behind why God wanted you to do that that you can't see. And we can't always see the reasons behind what God has said. And that's okay. You know, as absurd as it may be to dip seven times in the water, God may be asking you to do other things that may seem counterproductive or things that might not 
be the best solution, but he told you to do it, so do it. That's the point. There was a story, we just went to camp, we took 13 kids to youth camp uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was a guest speaker that had spoke, um, his name was Jeremy Donovan, and he has a ministry in Dallas, downtown Dallas, and he feeds homeless uh, people, he feeds people with, with very low income, and he has a lot of kids that he has to feed, and it's a whole food program that, that he has. And um, he was coming to speak, and he's, a, he's an amazing speaker, and as he was speaking, at the end of his sermon, the pastor of the camp came up and he said, you know what, we've never done this before, but I feel so led by God to ask for an offering from you guys. And he's like, I'm not trying to just get your money. You know, kids have already spent hundreds of dollars to come to camp. He was basically saying, I feel like God is impressing on me that we just need to, you know, give. And so we did. We, they passed the buckets around, and, and, and we found out by the end of the night, I mean, Jeremy, at the, um, you know, during the worship time, and they're getting, he said, just bring your money up to the front. So they, they had all this cash just laying. On. I didn't know the kids had that much money on them, you know. <laughs> And it's just like a ton of money, and, and they counted it up, and the next day we found out. So what happens is the, the first, the night, the, the preacher will preach to the kids, and the next day that same preacher will preach to the um, leaders, the youth leaders. So the next day in the youth leader seminar, he said, you guys don't know this, but I w Jeremy was saying this, the guy who runs the, um, the program in Dallas, he said, y'all don't know this, but I was supposed to come in the morning but I chose not to come that morning because our ministry was in the red and I was out there trying to hustle and trying to get whatever I could, whatever kind of deals I could get so that these kids would be fed. What I didn't realize was that God had money waiting for me here at this thing. If I had just trusted him, I would have seen that. And, and what they said at the end of the night, Micah, the pastor, predicted that the kids would maybe come up with about $3,000. But what ended up happening was the kids raised $10,000 for this guy's ministry. And that's enough money to feed those kids for a year. And he's like, you don't understand the, the weight off of my back that this is. To know that God hears us. We don't always know what he's doing behind the scenes, but if we're just obedient... You know, he, he's, he was kind of kicking himself. He's like, I should have just come to the morning session knowing that God had it covered. But he's like, no, I, instead, I skipped out on it, and I tried to hustle and tried to get money. And he's like, that was totally fruitless. But little did he know, God had $10,000 waiting for him. And now there's obedience involved with, with Jeremy, you know, like just trusting God to, to go there and, and to receive it. But there's also obedience on behalf of that pastor to, to, to hear what God's saying and say, we've never done this before. Let's do something uncomfortable. <laughs> Let's do something that'll get us out of our routine, right? The obedience of God will all often call us out of our seats and call us in to do something that will stretch us. Always. But it's always for his glory, for his good, for our good, uh, to build up our faith so that we look more like Jesus. And the Pharisees had a form of obedience, but it was called religion. The Pharisees in this story, yeah, you could say they were obedient people, but they were obedient um, to the law because uh, out of fear and out of, uh, not out of a relationship. It was not a love type of obedience. It was a dutiful, uh, you know, fear-based type of obedience. Jesus says in, in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. That's a relationship-based obedience. Men, you're obedient to your wife because you love her, hopefully. And you're a little bit afraid of her. That's probably a good thing, right? Uh, and vice versa, right? You, you obey when, when a, a loved one asks you to do something because you love them, right? It's not based out of fear. It's based out of love. And I find it interesting in this story that Naaman, his first reaction was no, no. <laughs> I don't want to do this. Like, God, you know, he's asking me to dip myself seven times in the river. He had an answer, but he said no. But it took a person to walk alongside of him, one of his servants, to walk alongside of him and explain to him, hey, think about it again. It was love. It was obedience in relationship. He had to receive the word of God through a person, through a relationship. And when he did that, 
he did get his healing. Not just the, so that highlights the power of walking with people through life, you know, that will point things out and, and highlight things to you, but also the kind of love that God, the kind of obedience that God asks of us is not out of hate, and it's not out of, um, you know, cracking the whip because you're not doing enough. It's always out of love. It's always out of your own best interest at heart, really. Um, there was a time a few years ago when um, I was writing a sermon, and I was just having a hard time with it. I wasn't, I wasn't really able to get, you know, articulate what I was trying to say, and, and, and I was kind of frustrated. Meanwhile, I heard that there was a, a kid in the youth group who was in the hospital, and uh, it was, he was, you know, uh, it was through, through something that he had done, um, some drugs that he had taken that he was in there, and I was feeling bad for him that he was there, but his mom had texted me, and she said, hey, uh, you know, he's in, the, he's in the hospital, he's recovering, pray for him. And I said, okay, I'll definitely pray for him. And I was like, I'll pray for him here in my, you know, you know. I don't, you know, God's here too, right? I can pray for him here. I justified it, even though I knew God was calling me to go to the hospital and pray for him there. But I justified it and said, no, I'll just pray for him here. So I prayed for him, and then I kept going with my sermon writing. Talk about a Pharisee, right? <laughs> like, no, God's here in this moment, but he's not over there, you know? And so I was just kind of writing my sermon, and she texted again, hey, um, he's doing better keep praying. I was like, okay, I'll keep praying. So I said another little prayer. And then about half hour later, she goes, would you mind coming down here? And I was like, of course I'll come down there. I should have done that in the first place. You shouldn't have to ask your pastor to come pray for you at the hospital. I should have been there, you know. And so anyway, I ended up driving down to the hospital and I felt like God was in the car with me. And as I'm driving to the hospital, I get to the waiting room, and when I walk into the waiting room, it's kind of like I walked into the cloud of God. God wasn't in my room writing the sermon. He was actually waiting for me elsewhere. And the Holy Spirit wants to lead us, you know, to, to obedience. And, and had I not been obedient, God still would have, you know, I don't know, uh, worked in my life, you know. But at the same time, God wants us to be obedient to experience him, and not only that, but I realized that my role in this situation was not just to pray for the kid, but mostly to pray for the, the grieving mother who's gone through all this stuff. We had church in that waiting room. I mean, I experienced God like almost I had never before because I had just been obedient, reluctantly, <laughs> reluctant obedience, but God met me there, you know, and he met me in that waiting room, and it was awesome. But the point is that God uses our obedience to get us in relationship with him, and, and he doesn't use it to, to, to harm us or hurt us. And that's often what we think. You know, um, it's easy to argue God out of something that he's calling us to do, but when we're obedient, that's when we look most like Jesus. And that's what he's trying to do in us anyway, become more like Jesus. That's what Naaman had that the Pharisees didn't have. They had a different type of obedience. Naaman had a relationship type of obedience. So we keep reading here in verses 15 through 19. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant now. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman said, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules' load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes to the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, Elisha said to him, Go in peace. So he departed. From him some distance. So basically, here's this guy, Naaman, who just got healed, and he wants to pay Elisha back with money. <laughs> what can I do? Pay? Honestly, that's a natural response. When somebody does something so great for you, you want to pay them back somehow. And here Naaman has lots of money. Uh, Elisha's answer to that is just go in peace. And 
the money, the, I looked this up, the amount of money that, he, uh, that Naaman had on him was 10 talents of silver, which in today's money is $14 million. No joke. I was like, really? 14, who takes $14 million on a trip? But I guess if you know you're going to be healed, like you're ready to give everything. I mean, it just shows you how much this guy had. And then the that 6,000 shekels of gold amounts to another $6 million. So he had about $20 million on him. Maybe I looked it up wrong. Somebody checked me on that. But that was what I found, and that's crazy. So here's a man of great wealth, and he received something that money could never buy. No doctor in, in, on earth could have fixed him, and here he wants to pay. And there was a guy at, uh, that called up our church once, and I led him to Jesus. Um, he was nearing the end of his life, and he said that um, he felt different once we prayed together and that he wanted to pay me. He wanted to pay off all my student loans and pay me a bunch of money. And I just, I felt like, wow, God would do something like that, right? Like, you know, that's cool. <laughs> it's fine with me. But, but I talked it over with Pastor John, and we both kind of saw that, you know what, his heart was, was maybe have been right in a way, but I didn't want to get into a situation where, you know, I don't know, there was no weirdness and only Jesus. I, I didn't want there to be like, now I'm his personal priest or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what he had in mind, but I felt a little bit weird about it. So I said, you know what, let's just, you know, be part of the church for six months. And, and you know, if you want to pay it off then, maybe we'll talk about it. But uh, anyway, it turned up that he kind of disappeared and um, didn't, you know, I, I wonder what would have happened if he really would have paid me for, you know, it's kind of like I gave him something that money cannot buy. And, you know, in so this situation, it's just interesting to read that because I was like, that actually did happen. Um, thank God for wise counsel, by the way, because had I taken it, who knows what would have happened. And, and Pastor John really helped me through it. He's like, you know, let's think about it. But, but paying someone for something they did is kind of a Pharisee move, right? If you can buy your way into healings and buy your way into heaven, right, that's something that your heart's not involved at all. Really, if you could just work hard, make money, and pay for spiritual things, we can't do that. That's what, this is a true man of God here. Elisha was saying, no, I cannot be bought. Um, he says, simply, he says, as the Lord lives before who I stand, I will take nothing. He saw right through the heart of the situation. And his final answer to this Naaman guy was just go in peace. The best thing you can do, the best thing you can do, Naaman, is just go in peace. And that word peace, I looked it up, and it means, the, the word that he uses here actually means completeness. And it means completeness in number. And if you think about the complete numbers in the Bible, seven is a, a number of completion. When he dipped himself seven times, huh? So a number of completeness. Go in your completeness. Soundness, it also means soundness, but specifically soundness of body. Go in your soundness of body. Go in your welfare. Go in your health. Go in your prosperity. Go walk out what God just did and tell the world about it <laughs> kind of thing. You know, it's not, don't try to pay me back with money, but honor God in what he did and, and, and tell the world. Walk out your faith. Just simply tell the world. Go in peace. Go in your wholeness. And um, this is what normal Christianity is. Um, normal Christianity is not sitting in a pew, staying quiet, and knowing the commandments. Maybe like the Pharisees were trying to do. Get everything right. But Jesus is saying, no, it's actually about going and living out the fullness of the gospel of God. Living out your healing. Even if you don't feel great, you will one day be perfect in heaven, and, and Jesus lives inside of you. It's kind of that idea that heaven lives in us. Let's bring it to the world. And Jesus is saying here that normal Christianity is preaching the gospel to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, setting free those who are oppressed, proclaiming the favorable day of the Lord. What he was saying here in this sermon was basically normal Christianity is not what you think it is, Pharisees. It's Think outside the box. Get uncomfortable. 
And that's where we need to be living with our hearts. Um, in camp, I saw a lot of that happening, a lot of this outside the box, go in peace, going in completeness, bringing that completeness to other people. Because um, there was a girl, Julia, she said one of her testimonies was that God healed her stomach so that she could have fun. Okay, that's a great testimony. That's one thing God did. God brought healing to her stomach. Daniel, I remember I was, we were worshiping together, and he, he said that his back was hurting. And I put my hand on his back and just started praying, and my hand on his shoulder and on his back, and my hand that was on his back was hot. I'm saying it was hot. Um, and, and I said, how are you feeling? And he said, uh, I'm feeling okay. <laughs> and he, but he still hurts. I was like, okay, well, let's keep praying. And I kept praying. And that night, he didn't get a healing, but the next day, he said someone came up to him and prayed over his back, and he did completely get healed. Um, we saw um, a girl who felt like God didn't see her. A guy gave a prophetic word during a service like this and said, you know, is Chloe in the room? And she stood out, and, and the word for her was, God sees you. And there was a girl, Madison, she had a vision of, of her uncle in heaven. And it's just all these things of, that, are, that are supernatural, that are, that are really what God wants to show us in bringing heaven to earth. And I believe that's what he was trying to say to Naaman, was like, don't try to do everything right and don't try to pay back what you could never repay, but live out your testimony and step out in faith. And if God tells you to do something, do it. And, and bring heaven to that other person. Like uh, this morning, I was just worshiping right here and Curtis came up to me and just started praying heaven over me. And afterwards, he said, you know, I was kind of nervous. I, I didn't ask him permission to say this. I hope that's okay. He's gone now. He's gone. He doesn't hear. And he, he was like, I was kind of nervous to do it. And I was like, why? He's like, you know, it just, you know, it, it felt like kind of a nerve-wracking thing to do. And I was like, well, I'm glad you obeyed because that's what God wants to do. Make us uncomfortable because it blessed me and then it blessed him in the end too. And I just feel like this is what, what Jesus is trying to get across, was that, you know, Naaman, though he was one of many lepers, he was someone who was humble enough to at least obey God. And in the end, he lived the rest of his life, and he wasn't even a Jew, but he lived the rest of his life knowing God healed him, and he could spread that to those that he saw. I want to show this video to kind of end the sermon. Um, it brings a lot of these points together. It's by... Uh, an evangelist called, named Todd White. He's got these big dreads, and he tells this story of how his wife came to know the Lord. But he's got this um, university called Lifestyle Christianity, and I got it from a website called Normal Christianity. The idea that normal Christianity is not just kind of, you know, folding your hands and, and, and you know, following all the rules. It's about listening to the Spirit of God, doing what He says when He says to do it, and, and, and living that adventure. So let's go ahead and roll that video. My wife, for eight and a half months, wouldn't go in public with me. I don't want to share how breakthrough happened. Sure. Okay, so one day, my wife says to me, she says, I'm going to go to the, to the grocery store with you today. And I said, no way. She goes, but I will not be with you in the store. You will go to one side, I will go to another. You'll get your things, I will get my things. You have a debit card, I have a debit card, we'll meet in the car. Do not take long. She goes, the only reason I'm going is so you don't take long, because I want to get this thing done. So it's eight and a half months in, she's never went, and Destiny, my daughter, is freaking out because my wife has never wanted to go to public, in public with us. So we go, I shop, there's a problem. I see a lady in a scooter, that needs prayer and my wife is in the store so I forget that she's in the store because we're on one side she's on the other so we start we go up to this lady and ask her if we can pray and she goes I pray honey I, I watch a certain uh, evangelist on TV uh, she goes and I pray every night I go but you're hurting still her granddaughter's with her she said I said what happened to you is it your knees or what is it I didn't have a word of knowledge she said 27 years ago I had four back surgeries she said, and I've been crippled since then. She cannot bend up straight and her back is fused straight like this in a seated position because of the pain. And I said, can we please pray for you? And she won't let me. So I looked at her granddaughter and I said, do you wanna have your grandma play with you again? And her granddaughter's the same age as my daughter. Her granddaughter looked at her and she goes, yes, I do. And grandma looks at me like, I can't believe you just did that. Like, why would you bring my granddaughter into this? I said, please let us pray for you. So she. 
She lets us pray, not without rebuttal, but she lets us pray. We pray for this lady. She's in the chair. I ask her to get out of the chair just to see. And so she says, honey, I'm in severe pain. My granddaughter had to drive the scooter to the car to get me, to get me into the car, to get me into the store, or to get me into the scooter, to get me into the store. I go, please. She goes, grandma, please check your back. Her granddaughter, who's not a Christian. She gets up. She stands. She's bent over. She's shaking. And I said, come on, let's pray again. So we prayed again. And all of a sudden, I felt something move underneath my hand. And this lady that's been fused for 27 years, she stands up and she starts moving around. Her granddaughter's like, oh, Grandma! And Grandma's like, she's crying. She's like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And the granddaughter looks at Grandma. She goes, Grandma, run! And so Grandma goes, run, I can hardly walk. She goes, come on! And she grabs her Grandma's hand. Yeah. And they run to the end of the aisle. And my daughter and I are there, and I'm crying my eyes out because this is a miracle, dude. It's what God does because wow. He's a miracle-working God. She comes back, and she comes back to me, and I'm like, Oh, my gosh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This lady's crying. Yes, granddaughter's so thankful that she has her grandma because she's never, ever been able to play with her grandma because her grandma's been like that for 27 years, man. Now she ran with her grandma for the first time in her whole life, dude. That, to me, is everything. My wife comes in the aisle, and we're in the middle of the aisle, and I look down, and I see my wife, and she's just looking at me, shaking her head. My daughter's like, oh. a lady looks at me, and she goes, what's wrong? And I said, no, nothing. That's my best friend down there. I said, can you please go tell my wife what just happened? Her name's Jackie. So the lady goes, I absolutely will. She goes, I can walk. She stood up, walked down. My wife's so angry, man. This lady's coming down. Destiny's behind me. Dad, what's mom doing? I said, she's really mad right now. Really, really mad, honey. I said, pray for mama. The granddaughter's looking at me like, why is she mad? I said, it's okay. She just doesn't understand. But everything's about to change. And I'm prophesying and declaring what's going to happen. And this, this woman's coming down, talking to my wife. My wife looking at me like, I can't believe you're telling her to talk to me. And I know what she's thinking. Then she talks to her. And all of a sudden, my wife looks at her, looks at me. She bursts into tears, holds this lady. They're crying. And I'm like, Destiny, mom's crying. She goes, why is she crying? I said, because she's hugging the lady right wow. now. She's hugging her. And my daughter's like, oh, my gosh, dad, this is amazing. The grandma comes up. She comes up. My wife won't talk to me. She's, she's sobbing. She is a weeping, sobbing mess. I'm sobbing. I hug this lady. The granddaughter drives the scooter out. We get home, I unpack the groceries. I, she doesn't say a word to me and I don't say anything because I don't want to mess this up, man, because God's doing it. He's the one, he's doing it. I go back to the bedroom. I'm crying on my bed for probably an hour and a half, just sobbing. I come out, my wife is on the couch still crying. I asked what happened and she said, God spoke to me. I said, what did he say? Because he's never spoken to my wife. She said, he told me that you just believe him, that it really hasn't been you. It's been him in you that's been doing these things, she said. And who am I to stand in the way of God? So we held each other and the persecution was ended at that moment. Yeah. But it was eight and a half months of hell like for her because she didn't understand. And if you would just break through and if you would just believe the gospel and press in and not be concerned about other people around you, as you are concerned with your relationship with Christ. Let that be your principle and your primary concern. That's true Christianity right there. I mean, we saw the humility of a person to, to listen to God, to obey the fact that God wants to heal this, this woman right here. And then her response after getting healed was running up to his, his wife and telling of all that Jesus did. You know, we saw that, that happen and and I want to see that too. And I think God wants to release hope in us uh, that that can happen. This is why Jesus came. This was the gospel that Jesus was trying to, to, to preach. And he was basically saying there's people here that have too hard of hearts that they won't hear it because they're from my hometown, because they believe certain things or they see me through a certain filter, they have me in a certain box. And Jesus is trying to break them out of that box. So if y'all would stand up with me. <clears throat> and the, the band can come on up. I do believe that God wants to release um, uncomfortability in us. I think that God's calling us to do hard things. I think that God, you know, if you follow Jesus and you stay the same, you really aren't following Jesus. 
right? If, if God calls us to do crazy hard things sometimes, it may not be dipping seven times in the, in the river, <laughs> but it might be even weirder. <laughs> it might be unconventional. It might be going to pray for people. It might be doing something a different way than you ever have before, but I believe God wants to release hope right now to us. So if you would bow your heads, let me pray for you. Lord, I pray, God, for anybody in this room, Lord, who has lived a very comfortable Christianity, God, and I am, I am the chief of that, God. I really do believe Lord, that it's so easy to fall into a routine um, and to see you as normal, Jesus, and to see the Bible as I've read it before or, um, you know, just to put you in a box, Lord. So that's the first thing I want to pray for, God. Anybody who just feels like they've been putting you in a box, God, they haven't been stepping out in faith, they haven't really been on the adventure that you've called them to be on, God, because they, 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 they just see you as these Pharisees did from their hometown. Father, I just pray that you would take away all of our preconceived notions, um, all of the religion, Lord, that we may have been uh, brought up with, God, or anything that may be hindering us from seeing you as who you really are, Jesus, as healer, as bringer of healing, God, the bringer of joy. Um, Father, I just pray, Jesus, that you would give us hope, God, that you can do anything, God, that anything you ask of us, Lord, is good, and, and, and it's, it's for our good and for your glory, Jesus. So, Lord, I just pray for anybody who just feels stuck in a routine. You feel like you're a Pharisee in some ways, or you focus more on religion than the relationship, and God wants to bring freshness to you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for that freshment, uh, refreshment, Jesus. I also want to pray for anybody in here who uh, feels like they've been striving and not receiving. Um, and and that, that kind of falls in the category of pride. Um, like me with my laptop, you just try to do everything on your own, and you, you need the humility of receiving from Jesus. If that's you, just lift your hands up in a, in a position of surrender. Surrender every era of your life to Jesus in humility. And Father, I pray that you would touch every area of leprosy in this room, every area that is dark, every area that we, we try to hang on to or fix ourselves. God, if we could have fixed it, we would have. Jesus, only you can fix us. Only you can heal us from the inside out, God. Only you can heal these situations that we're dealing with, Jesus. So we come to you humbly, Jesus, as your children. And we ask, Lord, that you would heal us, God. And that you, Lord, we need you, Jesus. We need you to do what only you can do, Jesus. So I invite you into every situation, Jesus, that we've been trying to control or we've been trying to do, God. And I declare that your healing would come in those situations, Jesus. And last, I just want to pray for people who have not been obedient. Um, you feel like God's called you to do something and you just haven't done it. You have that reluctant obedience. Like you'll do it later, but you won't do it now. I believe that God wants to um, highlight to you right now that that obedience is for your good and it's for his glory. When you are obedient and you step out and do what God's calling you to do, you'll see the healing come out. You will see what God's trying to do. So, Father, I just pray over everybody in here who just hasn't been obedient to your word and to what you're calling them to do. Um, may you, Jesus, um, meet them there. And as they're obedient, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're going to do mighty works. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, thanks, John. It's communion time. Um, so we'd like to invite everybody to participate with us here today. Um, a real quick reading here in Matthew chapter 26. It says, While they were eating, uh, Jesus and the disciples, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. So we take communion to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, but we also do it because we need forgiveness of our sins. So, like John said, don't get too comfortable. We're all sinners in here. Not one of us is perfect, and we probably all made some mistake this week that we need forgiveness for. And there's really three type of people. I, I read this. I'm not so smart to think of this on my own. 
three types of people living inside of us. The, the person we think we are, uh, the person other people think we are, and then the person God knows you are. And that's what we're trying to get in touch with right now, who God knows you are. And he loves that person already. That, that battle was won a long time ago, so let's take about 30 seconds and by yourself pray and repent of what you need to repent of. What God knows you already know. He already knows. He just needs you to say it. And let's get right with God now, and then let's take communion together and remember the sacrifice he's done for us already. So take about 30 seconds. So what we're going to do, if this is your first time here, is we're going to release each row one at a time to grab the elements and then go back to your seat and then we'll take them and pray together.